we revolve around the sun like any other planet. Those are the outlandish, and dare I even say heretical words, of Nicholas Copernicus. Or at least they were outlandish and heretical when he said them. Although right now, depending on who you talk to, they might be outlandish and heretical as well. Nicholas was not the first to come up with this idea. In fact, the ancient Greek philosophers, upon which much of our Western civilization is built, um, had conflicting views on the Earth's orbit. One camp thought that the planets orbited around the sun, but Aristotle, whose ideas prevailed, believed that the planets and the sun orbited the Earth. And so for nearly a thousand years, Aristotle's view of the stationary Earth at the center of the universe dominated natural philosophy and Christian theology. Yet it was a priest who brought back the idea of the Earth revolving around the sun. In 1515, a Polish priest named Nicholas Copernicus proposed that the Earth was a planet like Venus or Saturn and that all planets circled the sun. And he was afraid of, of criticism, I, I, you know, possibly from the church, but many people think mostly from the scientific community. And he was worried about the shortcomings in his theory. And so he actually didn't release his theory until shortly before his death when he published it in 1543. And the theory at first gathered just a, a spattering of, of followers. And to agree with Copernicus was very costly. Uh, many faced the charges of heresy. There was one Italian scientist named uh, Giordano Bruno who was actually burned at the stake for heretical teachings like the earth revolving around the sun and other things as well. But even as the evidence continued to mount and scientists continued to come behind this, people persisted in their skepticism. In 1610, Galileo found more supporting evidence for, this, uh, for Copernicus's theory, which is the heliocentric theory of, of the earth. And while Gal Galileo did not share the same fate as Bruno, he was still tried for heresy under the Roman Inquisition and placed under house arrest for the rest of his life. At about the same time, there was a German mathematician by the name of Johannes Kepler who was publishing a series of laws that describe the orbits of the planets around the sun. And still today, those laws are used in mathematics, and the equations are extremely accurate. But despite all of this empirical evidence that was mounting over and over again, it wasn't until 1687 when Isaac Newton put the final nail in the coffin for the Aristotelian worldview of the universe. Building on Kepler's laws, Newton explained why the planets moved around as they did. It was the force that was called gravity. And so, despite all of this evidence, why persist in doubt? Why, why was, was Copernicus's theory, why were people so afraid of it? Why did they, they think it was heretical or at the very least anti-scientific? I love what um, Johann Wolfgang van Goethe, what a great name that is. He, sa he, says, he says this, he says, Of all discoveries and opinions, none may have exerted a greater effect on the human spirit than the doctrine of Copernicus. The world has scarcely become known as round and complete in itself when it was asked to waive the tremendous privilege of being the center of the universe. See, the, the story of Copernicus reveals a very sobering truth. And the, it, the truth is, seeing isn't always believing. We're, we're familiar with that phrase, seeing is believing. Well, sometimes, as it turns out, you can see the evidence, you can see the truth in front of you and still not believe. There is something about human nature that will persist in doubt when all evidence points to the contrary. And as we continue our series on Jesus' last public monologue in John, Journey of Good Deaths, we have been returning to that simple truth over and over again presented by Jesus. Those who love their lives in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Following Jesus is a journey of good deaths. 
the death to self every single day. And this includes death to doubt. Old beliefs need to die in order for new ones to make way. Just as humanity had to give away their position as the center of the geographical universe, so do we need to die to the belief that we are also the center of our own metaphorical universe. Let's take a look at the text this morning. We're looking at John chapter 12, verses 37 to 43. And the text this morning is a short interlude. So this this passage that we're going through over four weeks is broken up into four parts. There's the first part of Jesus' talk, and then there's the voice from heaven when when the Father speaks to him, and there's the second part of his talk. And then the author, John, takes a break, and he adds some commentary to help us understand what is going on in people's hearts and minds as Jesus is speaking. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So starting in verse 37, it says this, But despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had done, most of the people still did not believe him. This is exactly what Isaiah the prophet had predicted. And Isaiah the prophet lived hundreds of years before Jesus. Lord, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? But the people couldn't believe, for as Isaiah had also said, the Lord has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. So that their eyes cannot see, and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and have me heal them. Isaiah was referring to Jesus when he said this, because he saw the future and spoke of the Messiah's glory. Many people did believe in him, however, including some of the Jewish leaders. But they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than the praise of God. They loved their life in this world. You know, there's, there's a series of, of reasons that we doubt. And John, John gives us a list of, of reasons that we doubt in this text. And the first reason is the assumed reason that he starts with is that there, sometimes we doubt because there's a lack of evidence. Uh, I don't know about you, but has, has anyone here have a friend who tells just absolutely fantastic stories, and there's just no way that they're true. Anybody here? Okay. If you don't have that friend, you are that friend, (laughs) and nobody believes you. When they're they're listening to your story, there's there's two words that are going through their mind, and they're like, prove it. Prove it. Show me the evidence. Show me the evidence that what you're talking about has actually happened. The reason that most of us doubt is due to a lack of empirical evidence. But this isn't the reason that the people didn't believe in Jesus. In verse 37, it says, But despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had done, most of the people still did not believe him. And in a moment of, of desperation, have you, ever, have you ever prayed this prayer, God, just give me a sign? Anyone ever prayed that? I've prayed that prayer. I've prayed that prayer a few times. You know, God, if, if, if you would just, you know, provide this for me, or God, if, if you could just, you know, heal this or this person, or if you could just do this, and we make these, these deals with God where it's, God, if you just reveal yourself, if you light up the sky, if you do this thing for me, then I will believe in you. Now, here is the really hard question. If he answered that sign, and maybe he did, he answered your prayers and he gave you a sign, did it actually make a difference? Or would it actually make a difference? You see, there's a very sobering study done by a Pentecostal scholar by the name of Ronald Kidd, and he wrote a fascinating book called Healing Through the Centuries. And he takes a look through, through various very peculiar and strange ways that God has healed people throughout the centuries. And as he, as he looks through all of these, these stories and all of these accounts of, of miraculous healing, he noticed that there was a group of people that believed and there was a group of people that doubted. And, and he looked into what the reasons were 
And one of the most surprising findings was that people's willingness to believe in miracles had nothing to do with the science or with the witnessing of the miracle firsthand. It had everything to do with their presuppositions that they were bringing to the table. They had already decided either in their mind or subconsciously that they believed or didn't believe. They, they already had their minds made up before the miraculous thing even happened. And so, the, and so we see this in, in John's account of Jesus' life. The people persisted in unbelief contrary to all the evidence. And yet, too, if, if we're honest, we deal with doubts as well, don't we? We ask for God to give us a sign, but God has already given us a sign. The death and resurrection of the Son of God. You see, the evidence that Jesus was a man, that he performed signs and wonders, and even that he rose from the dead, is absolutely overwhelming. There isn't a scholar alive today who's worth their salt that denies that Jesus of Nazareth was a real person and that he was crucified. Uh, New Testament scholar N.T. Wright comments that if there's one thing we can be certain about Jesus, it is that he was crucified. And so that's not up for debate. That's a fact. What's up for debate is the question that Jesus asked of his disciples. Who do you say that I am? Who is this Jesus of Nazareth that was crucified? And, and here, here's some more evidence about his his death, and even his resurrection. And, and these, are, these come from uh, N.T. Wright in, in his book. The first one, first evidence of, of the resurrection, you can put them up there, is that the burial, the burial of Jesus and the discovery of the empty tomb can be regarded as historically solid. It can be regarded as historically solid because there's nothing peculiar about those events in the, fe- in the sense that Crucifixion was very common in Rome. It was very common that the, the Romans on, on feast days would remove, would kill the body because usually it took days to die, kill the person, and allow the family to bury them to keep from stirring up more revolt and animosity. It was very common to be laid in a tomb that where you would roll a stone over. And so there's nothing peculiar about that historically. The second thing is that the Eastern narratives seem to reflect a mixture of eyewitness enthusiasm and strange bewilderment as to what has actually happened. And he writes this, he says, One gets the impression that the evangelists were really struggling to explain what it was that they and their colleagues had actually seen. They knew full well that the events they were describing were unprecedented to the point of being unbelievable. When you, when you read the, 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 res, the resurrection accounts of Jesus, there, there are so many things where it's like, if I were to make this up, I would not write it this way. First of all, they seem to be having a hard time of figuring out what Mary was at the tomb and when. Right? That's the, that's the kind of thing that you struggle with when you're telling a true story. Okay, was it Mary Magdalene? Or was it Mary the mother of Joseph? Or when was it? And you're trying to get all the details straight in your head. That's the kind of thing that happens. And so lots of people point to that and they say, well, that, it can't, the resurrection accounts can't be true. But actually, to the contrary, that's exactly the kind of way that you talk when you're telling true events, especially true events that were eclipsed by the miraculous and the supernatural. The other thing is that they, they record that it was women who found Jesus first. Well, in, in Jewish culture at that time, I'm sorry, ladies, but that was absolutely laughable. In fact, there were, there were many different um, Jewish rabbis and, and, and teachers who said, look, like, you cannot take the, the word of a woman in court, period. If you want somebody reliable, you can't go to a woman. That, that's the way it was. And all of the accounts of the resurrection own up to the fact that it was women who found Jesus' well, didn't find Jesus, who found the empty tomb, the first witnesses of the resurrection. And so there's, there's this, this understanding that, that there's just something unbelievable that is going on and, and you can't make this stuff up and we're just going to write it the way that it happened. 
The third thing is that the breadth of the people who saw the resurrected Jesus is overwhelming. You read the three different eyewitness accounts of the resurrection, and there, you know, there's, there's the women, there's, there's the disciples, there's Thomas, there's you know, the people who, who, who were standing around and saw Jesus' ascension. There's so much text and people surrounding that. Fourth, we have to wrestle with the question of why the early Christians said that Jesus is risen if all they intended to describe was a hallucination, a vision, or a vague belief that Jesus had ascended post-mortem into some heavenly, otherworldly realm. I know that's a lot of words, but it's a very common popular belief today to believe that the death and resurrection of Jesus is metaphorical. And so sometimes when people look at the, the story of Jesus' life, they say, well, you know, it didn't really happen. The, the, the apostles were just talking about this, this metaphorical new birth and this, this new life. They were trying to explain spiritual realities. But, but that is not what the word resurrected means. In, in the Jewish language, the word resurrected had a very, very specific meaning. And that very, very specific meaning is that a body dies and it comes back to life again. There is no other meaning in the Jewish language for that word resurrected. That's what it means. And we also have to ask the question, why, why would the disciples die on this hill? If it was just some sort of metaphorical, spiritual, in-the-air thing that had happened, why would they die for that belief? Number five, for all of you textual critics out there, which I'm not sure if there's any, and that's okay. I'm not really either. All the textual evidence shows that the written resurrection accounts happened remarkably close to the actual events they were describing. When you look at ancient texts, which is what this is, a bunch of anxious ancient texts put together, you look at how close the text was written to the events that happened, and that helps you determine reliability. And the resurrection accounts in, in the Gospels were written before even the letters of Paul, and, and, and in many cases, before the Gospels themselves were written. And they were, they, these, these stories were already in circulation. And so there's all of this evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it, it's all put in, in front of us, and yet people have been disputing whether or not it's happened for over 2,000 years. And it just goes to prove Isaiah the prophet right. Lord, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? God gave us the greatest sign of all time. The Son of Man, God in human flesh, came down, lived, died, and rose again. And we're at, left asking the question, who has believed our message? God revealed himself in Jesus. And yet, it can be easy to persist in doubt and unbelief. And the reason for this is that the main reason that we doubt is what Jesus calls spiritual blindness. See, friend, the reason that seeing is believing isn't always true is because sometimes you can see things with your physical eyes, but spiritually you can't see the truth. So here, here is an uncomfortable question that is surfaced by John. Who is it exactly that makes people spiritually blind? Well, let's take a look. Let's take a look at John 39 to 40. But the people couldn't believe, for Isaiah also said, the Lord has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. So according to this passage, according to Isaiah the prophet, according to John, the reason that people are spiritually blind is because God actually blinds them. That, I don't know about you, but I find that a very uncomfortable truth. It, it's something that perplexes me. And we can try to do some interpretive gymnastics here. We can dance around this, this passage and come up with all kinds of interesting and exciting new interpretations. But I think the most likely truth is as it reads. 
And just to make things a little bit more puzzling, let's back up to our reading last week, the end of our reading last week in verse 35 and 36, and let's take a look at Jesus' words in verses 35 and 36. Jesus replied, My light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can, so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. Then you will become children of the light. See, Jesus puts the onus squarely on our shoulders. He says, you want to talk about spiritual blindness. We're talking about light and darkness. You know, you can't get any more obvious. And he says, look, here's the thing. You are walking around in spiritual darkness. You are walking around blinded. But while I'm here, put your trust in me, and then you can see. Then you will no longer be spiritually blind. You know, in some ways, it's actually easier to accept a God that blinds eyes than having to take the responsibility ourselves for our spiritual blindness and our doubt and our unbelief. But which is it? See, there's two opposing concepts that are placed right next to each other, and this happens all the time in Scripture. We see on one hand, we see the sovereignty of God. The, the truth that God is in control over everything. That he guides and directs the, the, the path of history. That there is nothing that happens that is outside of his control. And then on the other hand, we have free will. The, the idea that, that we can choose to believe or not to believe. Because if, 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 if we didn't have free will, the cross wouldn't be a place of judgment. It wouldn't be the place of decision. But we have free will, and so it is. And if, if, don't worry. If you're, if you're worried like this is a big problem, there are books that are written about this problem. But let me abbreviate it all for you. It's as simple as ABC. The answer, if we accept A... In a very real sense, we, A being that, that God uh, blinds eyes. It, we, we enter into this, this nihilistic determinism. This idea, well, it doesn't really matter what I do or what I believe because God's in charge anyways and I'm just a robot, I guess. So that's the, to accept A. To accept B is to limit God's wisdom and power, which is not a step I'm about ready to take to be completely honest with you, to say that God is not in control and that things happen outside of his control. And that's not something that as Christians we should believe. But the answer, as so often is in the Gospels, is option C. Option C is to accept the paradox. So we talked about the cross is full of paradox. And, and we need to, to recognize and allow Scripture to speak for itself and understand that both of these things are true. And in our human, finite understanding, we cannot explain it or describe it in words. But here is the beautiful thing about holding this paradox in tension. What it tells us is, one, we can be saved if we believe and two, if God is the one who blinds eyes, God is also the one who can open them. Because John didn't divulge into this, this interlude to be like, well, guys, too bad. If you doubt, it's because your eyes are blind. There's nothing you can do about it. Goodbye. Close the book. Go home. That's not the point. The point is that if God is the one who blinds eyes, God is also the one who has the authority and the power to open blind eyes. And so Jesus can say, say don't doubt any longer, just believe. He is exposing the hard truth that we persist in unbelief even when all the evidence points to the contrary. 
When we recognize that we are spiritually blind, we can call out to the God who opens the eyes of the blind. We can turn to him and have him heal us. So the reasons that we doubt so far is we, we, we doubt because there's a lack of evidence and we think that that's the most obvious reason we doubt, but really the biggest reason we doubt is spiritual blindness. But John actually mentions a third way that we doubt, and that way is fear of rejection. Fear of rejection. This one provides another interesting paradox. You can believe and still doubt. Let's take a look at verses 42 to 43. It says this, Many people did believe in him, however, including some of the Jewish leaders, but they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them out of the synagogue. That, that was like church. You'd be kicked out of church. For they loved human praise more than the praise of God. They loved their life in this world more than than their life in eternity. You know, I remember back when I was a, a teenager, I went to this big youth conference called History Makers, uh, not History Maker, sorry, YC. Anyone, anyone know what YC is? There's, okay, there's like th- two Albertans in the room and they both know. Y- YC was a huge Christian youth conference in, in uh, Alberta. And you would go, and there were all kinds of these amazing Christian bands and these super inspiring speakers. And I remember this one night there was a speaker, and, and he, was, he was talking about uh, you know, leaving everything and following Jesus and, and being bold and courageous in our faith. And, and he had us at the end you know, stand up and chant, I will go, I will go. And it was awesome, and it was, it was powerful, and it was big. And when we were done chanting that, the band came up, and they played a really popular song at that time. And it was like, Jesus, I believe in you, and I would go to the ends of the earth because I know that you called me. And it was a beautiful moment, and there were tears in my eyes. And then it was time to leave, and we were walking through this, this corridor on our way to the bus. And I'm walking, and I see a homeless per- person on the other side of the walkway. And I just feel a little tug in my spirit. Hey, you just said that you would go, go. And I was like, I don't have any money, I don't have any cash, I don't know what to say. And the words of, of Peter came to my mind where, you know, I don't have any money, but, you know, I can, in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. And this guy wasn't crippled, but maybe I could pray with him or something. But anxiety just whoop, came in. It's like, I got to get to the bus, and I got to do this, and I got to do that. And what if the person looks at me like I'm crazy? And what if I get stabbed? And, like, all these things are kind of, like, going through my mind. And I'm coming up with everything. And, and before I know it, I had walked by. And, and to be fair, I'm going easy on myself, okay? I was an anxious teenage kid. But here's the thing, is the thing is, is that in church, in the moment, when things were spiritual, it was like, God, I believe in you. But then when the rubber hit the road and I was in real life, I cared more about what people thought about me than I cared about what God thought about me. And how often, on maybe a smaller scale, or maybe a bigger scale, I don't know. That is our response. We come to church, we get excited, we get fed, we get filled up, we're ready to take on the world, and then we go outside and we care more about what other people think about us than we do about what God thinks about us. You know, I I remember as well, I mean, early 2000s youth group was wild, okay? If you didn't grow up in it, you just don't know. But I remember, like, a constant conversation, a constant sermon illustration was like, if someone put a gun to your head right now and asked you to deny Jesus, would you do it? Right? That, like, I remember hearing that so many times. And, and you know, I remember having anxiety and, and, and worrying about this, but the, the truth of the matter, the fact of the matter, is it doesn't matter about that metaphorical situation because you would walk out the door and you would deny Jesus for so much less. You know, when things are black and white like that, it's a lot easier to think clearly. But when it's your reputation on the line, when it's your friendships on the line, when it's even your perceived how people think about you, mild persecution, we doubt. 
And, and I, you might be asking, Joe, like, okay, this sounds like fear. How is this, how is this doubt? Well, it's doubt because we have not internalized the love of God so that we believe that Jesus is actually enough. We have not eternalized the love of God so much that we believe that song that we were singing, that I'm a child of God. That he is actually worth the loss or even the perceived loss of reputation or persecution. See, in the Bible, belief is life. It's not a specific moment. It's not a specific decision. It's not just something in your head. It's something that is lived. And so when Jesus says, believe in me, he's not just saying, hey, memorize a bunch of facts about me and go to church on Sunday. He's saying, live. Become like me and live like me. And so the question I want to ask you this morning is, do you believe? Because doubt must die in order for us to live in belief. And this can be hard because it, it can feel like we're dying to a very real part of ourself because a doubt is also a belief in something else. If, if we have, have doubts in God, it's because we believe something that's not true. Old beliefs or lies have to die to make way for new ones, the truth. Belief in the lie that you are the center of your own universe has to be crucified every single day. Belief in the lie that God doesn't love you needs to die. Belief in the lie that your value is based on other people's opinions of you or on your performance needs to die. But when we die to these beliefs, new ones can be reborn. Belief in the truth that God is worthy of it all. So you can joyfully, gladly die to your pride and your false sense of control every single day and find life and life in all of its fullness. Belief in the truth that God loves you so much that he died for you. He isn't holding out on you. He isn't punishing you or judging you. In fact, he took your judgment upon himself on the cross through Jesus. Belief in the truth that you are a child of the light. That you are a child of God. And so that the opinion of other people doesn't matter. See, friends, belief in Jesus is to live a true and better story. And so let me ask you, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died and rose again on that third day? Do you believe that in him there is forgiveness of sins and eternal life? Because if you do, doubt dissolves under the relentless hope of the gospel. Only God can open blind eyes. I'm going to invite the band to come on up. As they, as they come up, I just want you to close your eyes wherever you are. And I want you to ask yourself this question. What lie am I believing? What area in my life am I doubting God's goodness God's power, God's love. Because we can believe in our heads that God has everything in control. We can believe in our heads that God loves us. But emotionally, we can be divided. So where is that doubt? Let's bring it to Jesus together. Father God, we come to you because only you can open the eyes of the blind. Father, we release our doubts. We release our unbelief. 
God, we release that lie that we've been clinging to and holding on to, and we let it go. We say, Jesus, I believe in you. Father, I just pray a blessing over every single person here who's heard your word today. I pray that it would take deep root in our hearts. And Father God, I pray that as we leave this, this building, that we wouldn't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But instead, would, would it just overflow out of our hearts the love and the hope and the peace and the joy of knowing Jesus. We ask that in your mighty and holy name. Amen.